Hello everyone, I'm Pratima Manohar. Hope all of you are happy, well and safe and in your homes today. Um, and even though our world is surreal at the moment with lots of pain at the moment, uh, this is such a great time to pay attention to important ideas of our collective future. So I'm so thrilled to bring you this series of conversations on inclusive cities with my uh, colleague Elsa De Silva. Elsa? Hi, everyone. Good evening uh, from Mumbai and good day to all our uh, viewers. Uh, this is our third episode of uh, Inclusive Cities. And today we are going to be talking specifically about uh, safer cities. And with us, we have uh, Juma Asiago. He is an urban safety expert with the UN Habitat's Global Network on Safer Cities. Welcome, Juma. Good evening. Good afternoon. You're based in Nairobi. How are you today? Good afternoon, Alsa Maria. Good afternoon, Prathima. Thank you for joining in. So we'll just dive straight in. How? First of all, you're based out of Nairobi. How is it over there? What's uh, the situation like? Wow, this is what we call um, trying to adapt to a new normal. Um, never has it been in the history of this city that um, people are confined to their uh, homes uh, for this long a period of time. Um, the bustling social life that Nairobi would see, um, particularly of its younger generation in public spaces, is no longer there. Um, and you find that there is indeed a level of stubborn resistance to the COVID-19 control measures, uh, so much so that um, government is struggling to enforce the social distancing measures, um, first by putting a curfew um, and now trying to lock down certain um, counties, including the city of Nairobi. Um, and let's see uh, whether the behaviors of people will continually reflect the seriousness of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Social distancing and, you know, government enforcement of lockdowns are some of the challenges. But are you seeing this and many others to be common challenges around the world since you work with different uh, groups and uh, cities uh, on the Safer City platform? What are some of the common challenges apart from uh, enforcing uh, social distancing that you're witnessing? Well, um, you know, first and foremost, uh, cities uh, like Nairobi have over the years been confronting several challenges around inequality and exclusion um, manifest in the way you see uh, settlements such as the informal settlements play out where you have over 50% of the population uh, living in just about five percent of the land, um, you find that in contexts like this, the challenges of social distancing are immense. And in fact, uh, many do not want to speculate uh, what would happen of cities uh, such as this when the transmission rates begin to be uh, understood to be uh, high as what we're seeing in uh, in the US or what we saw in China or Italy. Um, so the challenges of cities in developing countries such as Nairobi um, appear to have major problems that would emerge largely from the uh, the way the spatial, social, and economic uh, realities of the city, uh, largely within the exclusion and inequalities uh, dimension. Um, how the cities will be able to withstand the shocks and stresses, not just of uh, COVID-19, but if we also had just any natural earthquake. Um, for many years, the conversation has been, the cities are not prepared for this.
Juma, one of the big early lessons uh, of this coronavirus crisis, especially in the emerging world, uh, you know, cities like here in India, is the desperate need for um, resilient cities. You know, where all yeah. sections of the society, poor or rich, can survive this kind of a black swan event. Um, yeah. We need to first ensure, you know clean water, shelter, sanitation, and even basic health infrastructure to all of our cities, you know, statues, split trains or data centers, or even remaking our capital cities, a uh, major urban square can wait, right? I think that points coming out very strongly uh, through this crisis. So, uh, and you at the UN Habitat have always spoken about urban resilience as a key ideal, especially in the new urban agenda. So how should cities, uh, you know, think through this idea of resilience, especially, uh, you know, given the context of this pandemic, which, you know, which is kind of shown all the fault lines for all of us to see. So yes, yet again, we go back to looking at um, how the pandemic has played out across the world. And you find that in context where the capacities of resilience had been built from a people-centered and holistic approach, then you find the coping and that adaptation abilities of the cities and the populations being uh, quite well articulated. Um, and, and this in the sense that we understand urban resilience as the measured ability of uh, any urban system with its inhabitants to maintain continuity, uh, to maintain qu continuity in the face of shocks and stresses like this, uh, while at the same time positively adapting and transforming towards those very sustainable goals that they had set prior to this on. So um, we are seeing the, uh, the aspect of resiliency playing out more in terms of how cities are assessing, planning and acting to prepare for this uh, pandemic apex. And we are seeing actually very many beautiful stories or cases of persistence um, where cities are actually um, uh, looking at the numbers across the board and using those numbers to anticipate uh, how to deal with this pandemic. Um, so in this sense, I think we need to emphasize a lot the resiliency from a perspective of people-centered and holistic approaches. Um, we can see, for example, that while we thought originally of this crisis uh, from a personal hygiene uh, perspective, we now are seeing ourselves beginning to cope with the problems of domestic violence, the rise of domestic violence. Um, how many anticipated to see the rise of domestic violence amid such um, a, a pandemic? The question then becomes, when you look at the multi-pronged uh, holistic approach, how many countries actually have at the table of their emergency response measures those policies and programs that they originally have had around domestic violence prevention. Are they at play uh, to respond to this COVID-19 um, crisis? So we need that people-centered holistic approach to resiliency. It's really interesting that you bring up domestic violence because normally when we talk about safer cities and, uh, you know, we have hosted and Pratima has been a partner in two of our Urban Thinkers campuses, which we've hosted on behalf of UN Habitat's World Urban Campaign. Um, and we were talking mainly over there in, of safe public spaces. But in such a pandemic, the safe public space has actually shrunk in many ways and it's now moving to virtual spaces and um private spaces uh, yes. and people tend to actually silo those spaces as different spaces but even if you were to study the violence in a public space it's actually a spillover of 
some form of domestic violence into that space. So really it's forcing, this pandemic is forcing us to think holistically of solutions and think of violence as a whole. And what is it that we can do to re-imagine um, our solutions? And uh, since you said that cities are, um, you're seeing, or you're already starting to see um, some positive uh, you know, solutions emerge. Could you share a little bit with us or, um, you know, even if it doesn't have to do with domestic violence, some of the positive solutions that are emerging from your networks that you are seeing that we can uh, discuss and uh, deliberate upon? Yeah, so, of course, at the very onset from a systems perspective, is to understand that uh, good governance um, is at the heart of the responses that work. The, the responses that work to enable um, uh, populations to play their role at the very uh, neighborhood level. So one driver is the political commitment to inclusive urban development at multiple levels um, in the face of COVID-19. But the second one is, of course, the application of the range of mechanisms and institutions to facilitate inclusion. Yeah. And we have been developing these tools for over time from participatory policy making, accountability, universal access to services, including safe public spaces. Um, this, and more in particular, a strong recognition of the complementary roles of national and local governments, the multi-level governance of safety approaches. So we have, for example, the context of Taiwan and Singapore. Um, everybody now acknowledges that while it's still too early to declare um, a success, the early response of Taiwan and Singapore to the COVID-19 outbreak stands out. And why is this so? Because they had the investigative capacities, the health systems, and importantly, the right kind of leadership in place to rapidly take decisive actions. Uh, they were able to flatten the, the curve. Yeah, they were able to flatten the curve uh, through early detection, uh, thus keeping the health systems from becoming rapidly overwhelmed, like we see now in many countries, both in the developed and in the developing world. So not surprisingly, the cities that have robust governance and health infrastructure in place are in a better position to manage pandemics and lower case fatality rates. And I think this is something which we need to now see as the new normal of how we deliver inclusive urban development, that we put a strong focus on that people-centered effort on building the prevention capacities of cities. Um, and I think with SDG 11, quite clearly flagging safe, inclusive as part of the way uh, the planning paradigm, the management paradigm of cities uh, and the governance paradigm of cities needs to see their ultimate deliverable in 2030 is how we need to now start cultivating cities as elements of social integration. In Pedro, sorry, Pratima, I just want to follow up. Um, Juma, you know, our previous speaker last Friday was Pedro Ortez. He used to be the deputy mayor of Madrid. And in his uh, uh, you know, session, he actually spoke about multi-level governance. And at yes. the city level, he said that the issue tends to be that the amount of budget or finance available for implementation is very low in many cases. And yes. in the Social City program, which I know there's a international framework which countries sign up to, but at the, at the end, the safer cities is actually implemented at a city level. Are you also seeing that that is a challenge, the finance really available uh, at a city level? And this pandemic is showing that it has to be sorted out at the city level. It cannot be at the national, at the regional, or, the, or even at the international level. It's really even going down into the community, the suburbs, the local the very small units to contain this virus or to respond to it. I would like yes. your thoughts on that. Yes, I, I think, um, again, back to the 
the way we have articulated sustainable urban development over the years and the emphasis on local government as the level of government closest to the people being the one that can articulate a no one size fit all solution uh, for inclusive uh, development. Um, we see that in contexts where the political word decentralization has taken root, then you find that the, the preventive response mechanism begins to be seen to be working more in favor of the health infrastructure of those cities. But where you find cities, local governments today caught pants down with poor uh, infrastructure ability, including their own financing, to be able to address this pandemic, then we, we, we see the cities struggling with uh, no early detection uh, kind of systems. And uh, then you find also that the control measures that are being put in place are, are backfiring with, of course, other impacts on livelihoods um, that were not being foreseen before the control measures are being put in place. So, yes, indeed, uh, cities like Madrid are telling the stories of why we should actually embody a more bottoms up approach, empower local governments as those closely co connected to populations and as immediate providers of services, especially to those groups most at risk, to be the ones at the fulcrum uh, of co-producing the safety for all. Um, we have emphasized this away from the traditional ways of looking at pandemics like this, from the traditional actors to think about the local governance of safety frameworks. And I hope that this pandemic allows us also to come to the new normal of how governments begin to enhance their devolution uh, with the recognition of the evidence that is being uh, deduced from cities that there is differentiatedness that governments need to understand. And they need to then play the level of government closest to the people to articulate sustainable uh, development solutions today. Juma, resilience, the idea of resilient city has been a, you know, buzzword within the de development communities for, you know, for many, many years, especially in the context of uh, climate change. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of at least talks on building the capacity of the, you know, the local communities, institutions and businesses, uh, you know, to survive, adapt and grow during such uh, chronic stresses and shocks that we are all experiencing uh, right now. Uh, according to you, uh, it, I know it's very early days, but which cities um, are embodying this principle of resilience? And what is um, UN Habitat doing currently to facilitate exchange of best practices of governance and policy during this crisis? Yes, uh, like I said earlier, um, Taiwan and Singapore um, are certainly uh, good models that we could look at today in terms of how they adapted lessons from past pandemics. Uh, and this is what is uh, important for us to emphasize that the world has already gone through several pandemics before. Um, and there have been good practices that cities have leveraged over time to understand how to cope with uh, pandemics such as what we have today. Um, I think if we looked at closer to how Taiwan and Singapore use the right kind of leadership to take this forward is perhaps one of the ways that we can really take forward decisive actions, um, particularly in informal settlements, uh, empowering the people to use their coping and adaptation abilities to confront this uh, problematic. We need to equip the cities with the promising practices. And what Habitat has done in, in the recent past is to use its network of, uh, of partners to, um, to enhance uh, lesson learning um, of how one city is coping and how another city is doing it. And we're doing this together with 
uh, large networks uh, such as the United Cities and Local Governments Associ Association, which is really uh, at the forefront of helping cities learn from each other uh, on how to cope with this COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. But we are also going f not just uh, staying at the learning perspective, we're empowering, we're improving the accountability uh, we are showing cities the tools that we have generated over time as those that are most useful today to apply to mobilize action and transformational change. The new urban agenda is very clear now as one of the guiding plans of action that can be able to be adapted to this particular context, to integrate policies within broader urban interventions and strategies. And I think uh, as we speak to sustainable urban development being a driver for change, this is really the moment to make this happen uh, and to do this with measurement and monitoring frameworks in, in mind. We have those holistic solutions already in place. We already have the evidence of what works and what doesn't work. It's now the moment to catalyze that action also in line with the Secretary General's decade uh, of action to 2030. So, ma'am, I'm just going to press you again to just outline what are the two or three things that uh, Singapore and Taiwan did to be able to contain this pandemic that, you know, both developing and developed world have not been able to contain. What What's the secret sauce? What made them resilient enough to deal with this pandemic? What is the one or two things that is coming to the fore as we, you know, still are going through this crisis? Yes, one is the investment in their investigative capacity, the evidence in data. Um, they have had robust data systems over time, which now play out in terms of how to inform policy responses. I think this is one evident area that many cities do not really have, uh, disaggregated data that can actually inform um, uh, quick immediate actions such as what COVID-19 shows us. The second one is to em the emphasis on the right kind of leadership, the right kind of leadership to be able to mobilize communities to action. Um, I think this is an emphatic point that we need to keep raising that in most cities, the identity with their local government systems is very weak and already you start with 10 kilometers behind trying to mobilize communities to action. But where you have the right kind of leadership, then you're able to mobilize them towards flattening the pandemic curve. And the third element, which I can actually emphasize, is the systems thinking. How you use planning, management, and governance systems to deliver your actions at the level of land, housing, infrastructure, and basic services. Um, I think we need to emphasize this more and more that Taiwan, Singapore have shown transformational uh, developmental responses with this kind of principles in mind. And I, I'm sure uh, as many of the countries, both in the developed and the developing world, are able to consider these um, innovative ways to, to, to approaching the new normal that we are going to get into in uh, a couple of months in the social recovery stage. Juma, in Taiwan and Singapore, you know, the use of technology was quite central in their responses and they've used it extensively. So with this increased use of technology, how can we, en we ensure uh, and, you know, actually uh, make sure that th there's a rights-based protocol for policy making uh, and whilst they are ensuring good and efficient governance. I think that's very important. And we've seen in China, South, Af South Korea, in Israel, in Singapore, they've used technology in many different ways. What are your thoughts on it? Yes, um, I think uh, the whole question of smart cities uh, comes to play today with the way data and technology is advanced. Um, real-time data uh, for this for this particular uh, aspect, um, where we see.
promising practices. We have seen public and private sector partnerships evolve to a point where digital rights, uh, the conversation around digital rights, data storage in the public realm have become a centerpiece of how um, technology has worked to serve people-centered processes. And moving away from highly surveillance type of those that are actually uh, uh, serving to 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 advance their own development. So for Taiwan and Singapore, they made a proactive combination of this data, um, routine communication, rapid isolation, uh, personal and community protection in this way. I, I, I think we have over time emphasized on evidence-based community safety policies. And here is the moment when you begin to see those who have really accentuated on differentiating people and cities from a gender, culture, identity, age perspective, they have then come up with the best ways of responding uh, without looking at the one size model for everyone. And I think safety is going to become the new kid in the block for how inclusive urban development is seen in this differentiatedness, where we turn it from just being that risk uh, approach that many have looked at it to one where we see it as a space that brings the social capital, the innovations to approach uh, hitherto uh, prejudiced spaces into those spaces that actually provide the city solution. For example, we now look at informal settlements with a totally different eye. They are not just the spaces of challenge. Through data, you begin to see the coping and adaptation abilities that they can use through social cultural tools that are able then to drive communities to action. And so the informal uh, city that many have talked about is benefiting a lot from this new data dispensation to inform the way sustainability with culture and identity um, come to play. Zuma, I want to kind of focus a little bit more on why Taiwan and Singapore have been so successful. And, uh, you know, you spoke about data and you spoke about leadership and governance structures that have helped them succeed. And in developing world cities, like most Indian cities, we are today at, at a huge crisis because most of the informal workers in our city, which, you know, they make up almost 90% of our economy are struggling today because they lived on daily wage. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a ton of work that is going on to help them uh, with access to food and all of that, but they are struggling. Uh, and it's a, it's a ticking time bomb uh, for India, especially. So um, I'd like you to, you know, talk to us about how do we uh, ensure that the informal economy is supported through this crisis. Are we seeing examples of that um, in other places in the world? Well, um, I, I think the interesting bit that we now begin to understand is that um, there has to be some, uh, what I would, I would, I would, for no better word to use, um, social welfare systems that um, enable citizens um, across the board and not to be left behind when cities clamp down uh, on pandemics such as this, um, where there are some social welfare systems in place, then citizens are able to, uh, at least at the bare minimum, cope with their basic needs um, as we go through such lockdowns over three weeks or so. But where cities did not have this kind of social protection systems, uh, then we have the challenge. We have the challenge that people turn this conversation to one of hunger. Uh, how are we going to cope and adapt with no livelihoods? And government, of course, is at the best position to be able to address this by putting together those systems those systems that allow um, the inequalities and the exclusion that are rampant within our cities to be 
to be uh, brought closer, you know, to, to, to bridge that gap. Um, I think the only solution we can look at in this particular perspective is questions around how we govern our local environments, um, how we think of safety, not just as an issue of policing, but more as an issue of how the cities are better, are better planning at the level of neighborhoods, how they're better managing together with the populations. And I think where we see this pandemic response uh, so well executed with early detection possibilities, you find the systems being very clear to better plan and respond to the ec epidemic outbreaks. Uh, I feel this is where we need to look at closer at how local governments are wired and how financing to local governments enable that partnership with uh, other stakeholders in the city, with the citizen being the key actor. I believe if we look at this as the way in which um, um, to evaluate what has worked or not worked in cities today, then you will find uh, beautiful promising practices already in existence in several cities in Latin America, particularly. Um, and of course, in, in Africa, you have uh, South Africa equally at the front line of institutionalized practices around community safety forums. Um, and I think we need to understand how this developmental angling of safety has really uh, pushed the local governance of safety to become one in which citizens are co-producing that safety for all. I like that. Citizens are co-producing safety for all. So we are getting a lot of comments from our viewers. I just want to uh, do a shout out to Ethan, Ethan Kent, who has actually said Juma Asiago is the best. He helped get public spaces to be a focus of UN Habitat over 10 years ago. He understood placemaking and its role in safety and inclusion early on and welcomed the placemaking community into UN Habitat conversations. Was that uh, a difficult journey 10 years ago and today it's a very significant uh, one? Yes, indeed. Um, I remember the first time of the governing bodies of of Habitat uh, together with then the um, um, donor and the reactions that came from member states about having a resolution coming up on public space and the right to the city. Um, it was actually almost thrown out and this was very, we actually brought this, uh, if I dare say, from the back door. Um, and that particular resolution is what brought uh, rise to this uh, huge conversation around public space today uh, within the, the, the realm of sustainable urban development uh, in the UN process. And I can also dare say that place making, place governance um, became also more articulated in understanding uh, public spaces or understanding uh, the way communities appropriate uh, and the way communities play out to, to enhance uh, the vitality of their spaces um, and how they build management frameworks that could work for them and making public space less the, about a spatial or a planning issue, but more on management and governance. And so, yes, the place make King paradigm has helped cities uh, um, withstand community uh, involvement in the development of their cities, in accessing the benefits of city life. I think this is one of the spaces to watch closely. I want to do a shout out to Manoj Gursahani, who says it's a very useful conversation. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to combine a few of the questions. So Prasanji Chukla, as well as Doc 89B, have some very similar questions. So Prasanji says, the impact of the pandemic was very clearly visible on low class citizens or the informal sector, especially in a developing country like India. 
how to obtain uh, how to contain the urban poor in a pandemic situation like this and doc 89b says what's become evident in cities from the global south from india to kenya to ecuador among others is that the concept and tools of safer cities aren't integrated in how they cope with the urban poor the approaches dumas outlined are well and good in an ordered society but what are practical approaches cities like nairobi can take to minimize spikes of urban violence in provision of services yes i i i think uh, quite evidently uh a lot of the concepts around safe cities were clearly um developed in contexts where institutions have worked but that is not to say that it doesn't work in contexts like latin america and africa and asia uh we have seen the adaptation to models of citizenship security which is a very successful scheme in latin america we have seen how as i said countries like south africa cote d'ivoire have institutionalized safety and used safety actually as the way to propel the empowerment of gender um across the differentiatedness of these two paradigms for example youth across their different behaviors lifestyles and circumstances and more important how they have helped to decriminalize poverty uh, which is a largely a big problem in the way we approach uh, cities today uh, by just showing that poverty was not the cause of crime uh, but rather what underlied poverty was social exclusion and what cities needed to address more was social exclusion so in countries like india um, this is a very important uh, paradigm shift to look at ways in which crime and violence is addressed uh by not just articulating in formal settlements by the handout mentality that's or the containment mentality that uh, we we of, often look at in terms of upgrading policies but rather to look at what are the um the values that citizens have have developed over time to cope and adapt with areas that were largely considered hot spot areas and how to use those informal uh social capital to help uh reinforce the new neighborhood normal um i think uh we have to again approach safety with a governance perspective in mind and think about how we are reordering the way communities in informal settlements think of themselves and how they have innovated public spaces for example how you build that identity that they have come across within public spaces as the way to promote safety in the neighbors how to link education and literacy how to build up on the artistic uh, and cultural movements that are being generated out of this informal economy and make this work to make safety a uh, reality in cities um in the developing in the global south we have a few more questions i am going to read out something from celine uh paramundial i hope i'm pronouncing that right uh who's speaking about this kind of dramatic shift that we are seeing even in you know countries with high development indexes right like in europe uh, we've spain and scotland who've announced the permanent uh universal basic income do you see this also coming to other parts of the world uh, especially in countries like india that's her question um to the extent that we acknowledge again from the local that you find in countries like india the sort of cooperative um societal schemes um some countries call them the merry go round type of schemes that communities themselves are inventing to um enhance their own income capital to the extent that those type of systems are acknowledged and scaled up to the way social welfare systems are understood in the global north is the way this would be successful but of course if we came with models that of course um i just adapted to the context of the global south from how they have worked in the global north uh, then you will obviously find such systems failing or aiding um trades that otherwise do not get people beyond underemployment 
or beyond uh, uh, livelihoods that are not decent enough and productive enough uh, to get them out of informal settlements. So this is probably where we need to look at. We, we have already the working solutions within those informal settlements. And yes, we need to think of a model of um, collective income generation, some call it crowdsource funding, uh, some way in which communities themselves can build their collective potential to generate resources uh, in space and place. Uh, I can tell you, for example, there was an exam a, 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 an interesting encounter I had in uh, Nairobi's Kibera. Uh, of course, the numbers of people in Kibera is, 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 is always contested. But at that time, it was looked at as though we had about 800,000 people living in that uh, uh, slum, which is one of Africa's largest slum. And there's, there was a 12-year-old child who said, we don't need aid. If we only had a system in which we all could contribute a shilling, one shilling, which is a Kenyan currency, a day, in a day we would be able to generate 800,000. In a month we would have 24 million. Uh, and, and when you think about that type of thinking and see how such kind of thinking is able to buffer communities in moments like this, it's, it's immense. Uh, we have the potential of community organization as key to the way income capital can actually be uh, generated in favor of people themselves. And local governments should play that role in helping to coordinate such kind of uh, systems. Do you I have a to, question? To, actually, Pratima, because we're talking about the power of community, Juma, I want to share that during COVID-19 in Mumbai, Project Mumbai by Shishir Joshi, uh, a really stellar individual. He, uh, his organization, along with um, many other organizations. So he's created a collaborative platform where everybody can come together. And in less than ten days, we have ramped up from thousand meals to fifty thousand meals every day. So that wow. is really the power of the community. You know, each one pitching in. Uh, somebody donates money. Somebody donates food. Somebody volunteers to distribute the food or pack the food. And it's really uh, also complementing the efforts of local government, filling in the gaps where, uh, you know, uh, if there are any, the gaps, if there are any. And I really think the power of community is something that we need to explore more and more. Yes. Pratima, and you can go. I think yes. I completely agree. I think the biggest lesson for all of us, uh, you know, during this, crisis is uh, just grassroots level innovation and leadership at the bottom. Uh, a lot of times there's so much attention paid to the prime minister and president's office. Well, a lot of these issues have to be sorted out and fixed at the community level. And I hope that world leadership enables and build capa you know, builds capacity at the local level, because that's where most of this crisis will be handled and fixed as we go through this. Um, we have another question and comment um, from In Awe Towards Green, uh, from an urban planning, and she says, uh, or he says, from an urban planning point, should not decentralization of infrastructure, uh, health, transport, and governance be the one answer to tackling pandemic situation, which is what we've been talking about. But would you <laughs> like to uh, shed more light on how we can enable that, Juma? Um, I, I think uh, we, we basically are saying that uh, we already have the existing tools um, to be able to advance um, uh, more uh, area-based uh, management um, systems. And I think we have the, it takes the political will, the political will of governments to adopt this type of tools to be able to um, deliver them at the level of infrastructure, housing, and basic services. Uh, yes, I am for the idea of uh, decentralizing uh, transport health um, to levels that relate with communities. 
um, health centers should be nodes in a city where the production of safe spaces uh, for communities is a key dimension of how they exist. They should be spaces that are integrated in a multi-purpose use type of uh, facility. But if we see them today as they speak, they are obviously em empty spaces, many of them very uh, I think we've lost Juma. Way to help communities yes. achieve sustainable urbanization. Yes. No, we we had a lag in the connection, uh, but and we are I back. think again. Yeah. Yes, and I think of course we we always keep talking about cities like Medellin, uh, with their communal stress, which at one point in the time of Mayor Fajardo was understood to be a a, a success and a a big paradigm shift in the way urban development was understood. And why was that so? Uh, the whole concept of social urbanism, uh, which I think we need to look at more and more closely and understand how different elements from the prevention of crime and violence to the metro cables uh, that enhance the mobility within the space called Comuna Stress became the way the people uh, established pride in place, the way crime and violence uh, deteriorated, the way uh, communities began to become key agents of their own social change processes. So yes, uh, transport is one of the levers that we can use in cities to be able to enhance community organization and empowerment. It's a space that we can actually capitalize on to build the identity of how safe cities for women can also become safe cities for all. Uh, so, yes, it is a powerful space to leverage on. We have a question and comment from uh, Jacqueline um, Witchfiki. Uh, and she says, uh, after the COVID-19 has been eradicated, what policies do you expect the majority of cities to adopt across board what will be the long term policy impact of this pandemic on this on our cities i i would say um we have used the words prevention 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 uh, for over years and this has hardly been very well entrenched within the um, city paradigm um I think we always are akin to respond to immediate uh, crisis rather than think 10 years down the road and understand how to build those type of prevention capacities. I think the new policies that cities will see as priorities tomorrow will be those that really emphasize on building the preventive capacities within our neighborhoods. And I think what the climate change movement has already uh, begun to advance with the C40 group um, can easily, those gains that are being made in spaces like that can easily be adapted or catalyzed to show how we approach safety with a multi-dimensional lens. Uh, safety from a perspective of natural and man-made disasters, safety from a perspective of crime and violence, safety from a perspective of tenure insecurity. There are a lot of tools that can cross fertilize each other and help cities establish the policies that are identified with their population's needs, immediate needs. We have a couple of uh, uh, comments from Prasanji Chukla. He says, uh, with the lockdown, there has been a significant reduction in pollution levels in turning in healing the ozone layer which has turned out to be a fortune for biodiversity and we are seeing pictures of peacocks in mumbai dolphins all over the world appearing yesterday i was on a network chat with uh, someone from brazil and she says she lives by the ocean and there are a lot of fish you know um, 
that you can visibly see now. So Prasenjit asks, can such a lockdown mark its place in the calendar year at a global level, just like an Earth hour? That's a really interesting uh, concept. And in one of my daily reflections, which is another chat show that I host, um, my guest, Sutapa Stanyal, she actually said, what if we were to have a five-day working week and on, a, on the sixth day, say a Saturday, we did all our chores and on the seventh day, we stayed indoors and instead of calling it Sunday, we would call it Earth Day and just give the Earth a chance to uh, recoup and breathe and we can take a break indoors for a change. So, yeah, I think people are noticing the difference. Do you think that that is a possibility? I don't, I, I mean, it's an ideal scenario and I'm putting you on the spot, Juma, but it's something to think about. Yes, I, I think we, we can today with the evidence we have, imagine future scenarios of cities that are, are positive. I mean, I'm imagining urbanization as a source of development and not as a bad outcome of development. We, we have the ability to create those type of futures that some consider to be dream, dream scenarios. Cities are the biggest, uh, what I call the, 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 the biggest human creations um, or the human inventions. And this is something we cannot dispute. Um, their potential to enable people to overcome their present challenges is immense. And the potential to leverage on what cities' ability by virtue of just their population concentrations and the diversity of populations within those cities is something we need to begin to appreciate. Uh, move away from the perspective of the city as just a challenge to one that we can actually leverage on its coping and adaptation abilities to then create those futures that uh, Elsa, you are, are speaking to. Uh, those possibilities, we need to create those future scenario uh, tools to enable policymakers know where to invest and how to move to the cities we want in 2030. Juma, one of the big debates that we find ourselves in within the urbanism community is about density. Um, yes. Obviously, you know, the pandemic has been roaring in the big cities, which are highly dense, uh, New York, London, um, and also, I mean, my view is that they are obviously the command center of the global economy. So they have a lot of, you know, movement, and that could be one of the reasons. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, the question that we have here and comment from Himanshu Chandra is, does this whole idea of compact city uh, with high density need a rethink um, as they seem to be at the front line of this crisis? Uh, and all of us within the urbanism community, you know, believe in, uh, you know, density as one of the crucial ways to help with sustainable goals. Uh, and I think there's a need to differentiate between density and crowding. Um, and, and, you know, also need to differentiate between density and giving good quality spaces to all its inhabitants. So um, what's your take on this whole uh, question on um, density? Yes. Um, let's not challenge the fundamentals of society. I think we are part of a, a big uh, uh, social uh, reality where proximity is a key aspect of who we are. Um, yes, COVID-19 has brought isolation measures as the key way to tackle the problem, but that doesn't make us lose who we are. Um, and I think the aspect of looking at the 20th century urban development model that failed, that accentuated the crisis we face today in terms of poverty, um, it, it does not go by virtue of the fact that we now have COVID-19 to move away from the sprawled model to one that is mixed use, compact and interconnected. I think uh, we have seen those models work for cities today that are successful. And I think we should emphasize more that density is good. But the question is, it must be done within an optimum 
uh, a well-planned uh, paradigm. Um, density must come with well-planned uh, frameworks, uh, management frameworks and governance frameworks. You cannot do without those systems um, to make it work uh, in favor of people. So we want to build cities for people, not people for cities. And so uh, that this densified, uh, it depends on the optimum you're looking at. And I think Manhattan, which is always quoted as, as a, a model, even now in the face of COVID-19, uh, still is a sustainable model that others want to look at uh, from how they have helped um, uh, factors of agglomeration come together. And I think we need to, to really um, begin to think about the wider problem of inequalities and exclusion and see how we actually build back those cities that uh, enable the individual, the community, the neighborhood, the family, um, really uh, operate at the uh, scales that are, are manageable to them. Um, yes. We have two questions on violence. So Yangbo Du, uh, thank you Yangbo, you're a regular on our uh, Inclusive Cities series. So Yangbo says, Juma, you mentioned the paradigm shift from poverty as a cause of violence to poverty as effect of social exclusion. What do you find are the main barriers to overcome in promoting such a shift? And Ruchi Varma says domestic violence was already a virus, which is only deepening with the pandemic. Do you think we will be targeting the problem differently? And what kind of preparedness and preparation do you foresee? Okay, so I think one is about the shift in attitudinal changes. Um, I, I, I think uh, we can only begin to approach um, crime and violence away from poverty, decriminalizing poverty, when we look at the facts and we begin to challenge some of our perceptions. Uh, I mean, something as simple as looking at why crime and violence rates are high in a neighborhood like uh, uh, in Nairobi, Kibera, uh, which is uh, uh, much uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, if you compare this with Mumbai, for example, Mumbai has far more absolute levels of poverty, but it's far much more safer than Nairobi is. Um, so if we had the notion that poverty is the cause of crime, then it should have worked in the reverse. Uh, so when we begin to understand this, then we ask ourselves, what are the underlying el elements? And we begin to think about the cohesiveness of societies like in Mumbai, uh, what culture plays to how people uh, leave. Uh, and I think the barriers then begin to be addressed at that point of time to understand identity. What is the identity of a city like Nairobi? Uh, what is its culture of ownership? Uh, and you, when you begin to ask yourself those questions, then you understand where the problem lies. Um, the sense, the lack of sense of identity. And that's where we need to invest. Uh, the informal economy, the informal city has all the solutions to give us that kind of um, answer. Uh, and I, I would imagine that those of us who will recognize it in policy will overcome that barrier. But if we continue insisting on, I'm not a fan of master planning, for example. Um, if we continue insisting on certain ways of how cities functioned or were created in the 20th century as the models of sustaining of achieving sustainable urban development, I'm sorry, we will continue perpetrating the same old and not seeing the holistic approach to cities. Uh, I, 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 that, that's my, my own personal observation. We need to adapt. I just want to uh, again point to uh, the comment from Ethan Kent, uh, who, as many of you know, is the co-founder of Placemaking X and a key part of uh, Project for Public Spaces in New York. Um, and you know, this is we are 
living in an era where you know we are not now you know able to engage with the public realm and the urban commons of our cities and uh, obviously it's it's a crucial part of any city i al always call the public realm as the soul of any city and uh, i am interested in this conversation on how we are re equipping the uh, urban common to deal with pandemics like this and i remember seeing this image that uh, ethan posted of uh, having just you know hand washing facilities um, within the urban commons or even you know when i think about uh, a city like mumbai and uh, all the amazing work that project mumbai is doing uh, you know just places to convene so we could uh, you know play a role in giving access to basic food and other services to the community so do you see the value of uh, and the approach for public spaces and urban commons change post this pandemic um yes uh during my graduate studies at oxford i i came closer to understanding part of what would be the paradigm shift in urban development today and one of those was the fact that we need to move away from the traditional disciplines that understand city and urban the planners the engineers the to uh, to start embracing more the non traditional disciplines and how how they would understand their role in city life now the place making um concept allows for this non traditional actors to play a role in conceiving this multidisciplinary uh, way of looking at sustainable urban development and where expertise is not in the discipline but rather is on the community as the expert so if we are able to take this i think what ethan is trying to push forward around the world uh, with the place making and place governance concepts is is truly one of the ways in which we could actually achieve this with communities as experts So we have two more comments that have come in right at the end. We are going to take them, Juma, if you don't mind. So Daniel Colombo says, "Can you please address the impact of COVID-19 to issues of density with reference to informal settlement upgrade as the state takes over mitigation measures to curb the spread of the pandemic? My guess is that health and safety will take precedence over progressive policies. How does that affect?" in situ upgrade and maybe we'll combine it with this other one from smriti from mumbai it's clear now that there are two cities within a geographical city one better equipped to deal with pandemics and the other isn't do you see this become part of the urban agenda and the next sdgs at the un level uh will this become part of the urban agenda and the next sdgs at un level um of course yes and as i said um if you look at programming within habitat for example uh, uh, the city's resilience profiling program you already find some of the solutions already having been conceived a couple of years back uh, with the idea of equipping cities with tools empowering communities improving the accountability of uh, of communities with the uh, local governments providing a common understanding of the resiliency framework and mobilizing action and transform and transformational changes so i think the new urban agenda is our plan of action that has uh, a myriad of solutions it's not so much now about the what it's the how and i i sense for example if we look at national urban policies today in the way they are institutionalized within government will make the difference if we continue having the paradigm of thinking of national urban policies within one sectoral line ministry of government called housing or urban development as opposed to positioning it at the level around national development plans across government ministries uh, we already begin to have part of the challenge to implement the solutions at the local level so this integrated way of how we approach urban today uh, answers the question of 
health and safety vis-a-vis -vis in situ in situ slum um, improvement. Um, and I, I think we need to move away from the old models to embrace new thinking uh, around uh, our, our settlements development. It's not easy and it will of course face a lot of criticism. Um, I know this is something that is clear around us, but if we understood then the positive source of urbanization for development, we will uh, overcome the uh, traditional ways of looking at cities as just the, the paradigm or the arena for certain uh, disciplines to think of a more multidisciplinary way of approaching city as a site of social interaction, as a landscape of economic vitality, as a space of political contestation. And we will, we will then definitely embrace citizens and their right to city, the benefits of city life as the key driver of any actions we take. So yes, health and safety may provide us the answers eventually as they come with the, with the heartbeats of people to understand the grammar of the city. Uh, in public spaces, for example, as we look at public space today, uh, many are kind of, uh, it's mind boggling to understand how we think of public spaces, if not for people being at the center of that. Rather, today we are talking of how we isolate those public spaces. Um, so the new normal that comes out of COVID-19, if we are not going to understand that lesson, which comes from the health and safety paradigms, then, and we continue with the business as usual, urban development modeling. I'm sorry, that's just one of the failures we will have for 2030. Well, on that note, I would encourage everyone to check out UN Habitat's uh, new urban agenda. It provides the framework for all that we've spoken about. And it is up to each one of us to ensure that we uh, get it implemented in our communities, in our cities, push our governments to adopt it. And, um, you know, as Juma said, it's, there's no, no reason to now keep on discussing, you know, about the what, it's about the how you get it implemented and how do you make that change. And um, yeah, I look forward to, um, you know, all of us participating in making sure that our cities are inclusive, safe, resilient, because cities are where we live, we work, we uh, party. Let's not forget that right now we are closed up in our homes, locked down in our uh, apartments or houses. And uh, it's really a moment to reflect on all that we've taken for granted and reimagine a new way of living, a new way of uh, functioning as a society. So thank you, Juma, for sharing your thoughts. Um, thank you. Appreciate everyone for joining in from all over the world. Um, Pratima, over to you. Thank you, Juma. That was such an enriching conversation. As we are all locked down uh, in our homes here in India, um, and you know, it almost feels like we're in this dystopian movie, and uh, we don't really know what's the end game. So. Um, you know, I really want to thank the wider community that has been joining us through these conversations over the last couple of weeks. Um, like I said, this is a very important discussion to have for our collective future. So, you know, it's, it's a way to entertain ourselves as we uh, are locked down in different parts of the world. But I just want to give a big shout out to this amazing community, which comes back every week. We, we are hosting this on Wednesday and Friday every week on different topics at uh, 6 p.m. India time and 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. So please continue to join us, write to us and let us know topics to discuss, people to talk to as we uh, kind of battle this uh, huge challenge that all of us are facing. I also want to uh, quickly point out point out that Elsa and I are uh, hosting this as part of uh, 
Stanford Center for Democracy, Development and Rule of Laws Leadership Network for Change, which we are both alumni of. Uh, so thank you uh, all again for joining us and continue to be in touch and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Juma.